All right, good evening, everybody. Um, so, uh, the answer to the question was, the company limited by guarantee. Uh, <laughs> and the reason why I can tell you that, go back to the beginning, is because I'm a lawyer. Um, so, the purpose of being here this evening and the discussion this evening is to explore intellectual property rights, to give an idea of what those rights are. Once you understand intellectual property rights, as with anything that anyone gets geeky about, you see them all around. Um, and if you're in business or you're working within a business, once you understand the importance of intellectual property rights and the importance of protecting intellectual property rights, it gives real value to what you do and it gives real value to a business. So I'm a founder of law firm Burwins. Um, got an office in Harrogate, office in Leeds. The office in Leeds is branding, branded as Berwyn's Digital. So it's all about uh, tech businesses. Uh, I call myself a tech lawyer. Um, I'm a director of Leeds Digital Festival, so very, very much involved in that. Um, third year of that coming up. Um, so look out for that. That'll be, that'll be really, really good. Um, so that's what I do, get involved in technology contracts, things like data protection, GDPR, companies, companies buying, selling, investments, and all that kind of thing. So that's what I do. Um, so what are intellectual property rights? Um, there's a few formal rights. There are five formal rights. So um, patents, copyright, design right, trademarks, and database right. Um, I won't talk about design right and database right because they are less relevant to this area, but I'll talk about the others. So, I'm also going to talk about some actual cases that I've come across where there have been problems with intellectual property rights because you will then be able to identify where those issues come within your own activities and businesses and so on. One is a business intelligence company um, which sold in 2001, I think, sold for $6 million, or it could have gone completely bust within moments of that happening. Um, the other is a care company, a domiciliary care company. Not a tech company, you would have thought, but like every company, it's got tech. And the other is to do with the Tour de France. So why the Tour de France? Because major sporting events have a massive amount of intellectual property around them. Again, I'll come on to that, and you'll start recognizing where that comes. So within tech and within creative industries, the things that you need to look at are what rights are there in what you're doing? And often that will be a, quite an analysis, and you'll find that there are many, many layers of different rights at work. Um, have you got the right to use what you're using? and we'll see that that's where problems can come. Who actually owns the rights? You as an individual, your company, somebody else who's created them. Um, and very often people come to us and say, I've got this great idea, how do I protect it? And the answer is, in formal terms, you can't protect an idea. What you can protect is the expression of an idea. So if you come along and say, I've got this great way of doing business, there's not going to be anything you can protect there. You can protect to a degree as between two different people. So if you're pitching an idea to a company, you get a confidentiality agreement. But that's not very, a very strong protection. You're not protected against, if you like, the whole world. So formal protections do protect you against the whole world or within a country, uh, whatever it might be. So firstly, patents. So very often people will say, I've got this great software we're developing, I want to patent it. And usually the answer is, you can't. The reason for that, uh, I'll mention in a moment, but a patent has to be something that is innovative, has an industrial application, so it can't be, I've created a beautiful chair or something of that sort. It has to be uh, industrial. It gives you, if you have a patent, a 20-year monopoly right. 
Uh, it can't be for business methods. It can't be for software. And it's very expensive. So why can't it be for software? Specifically, uh, all the legislation around patents in Europe say that software can't be patented as such. And yet, there are a huge number of patents which are to do with software, because if the, if the uh, software has a technical effect, there are patents around it. Hence, uh, huge amounts of litigation between Apple and Samsung and all these companies, they're all about patents. It's huge, so there is huge value in that, and people will hoover up patents and then uh, claim, make claims of, of infringement. They say it's expensive to get patents. It's generally a game for people who've got fairly deep pockets. Um, they're registered at the Intellectual Property Office in the UK. There's the European Intellectual Property Office. And patents are patentable. Oh, sorry, software is patentable in the United States. So there's a whole battle goes on between Europe and, and the US over that. So that's patents, but generally speaking, if what you're doing is writing software, you shouldn't be th thinking in terms of patents. That's really a question of copyright. So copyright protects creative acts. So software, sounds, words, pictures, um, they have to be, the software isn't registrable. Uh, it creates, it, it arises automatically. So if you think about a website with lots of interactive features, for instance, or game, or something like that, there's going to be software, there's going to be code behind it, there might be music, there might be video, there'll be words, there'll be pictures, there will be pictures that somebody has taken, there'll be video which has had a director and a producer and a cameraman. Uh, so each time I mention one of those things, there is someone creating something and there is someone having some rights. So um, that is pretty much the key right in tech, I'd say. Um, and software licenses are all about protecting, uh, protecting copyright. So how do you license software? It's a big part of what I spend my working life dealing with, so contracts around software. So what, you, what you're protecting is very often the source code. Obviously, there's object code, the source code. You're protecting the source code because the source code is human readable. Um, and that often then is the, if you like, the crown jewels of a company's business, the source code in their software. You need to be really careful on that because very often people will use, because it's easy to use, open source software. If you use open source software, then depending on what license lies behind that, you could be opening up the source code of your product to the whole world. Um, so open source products are... Uh, use a var variety of different licenses. Some of them require you to uh, disclose your source code to everybody. Some of them have um, a viral effect, which means that anything that's produced subsequently is also has to become open source. At the moment we're dealing with the sale of a company and we've had to go through all their software, all their open source products and, go and check what the licenses are and whether they are licenses which are going to cause a problem with their product. Um, and the buyers are very keen to know that because they're very keen to know that they will get all the rights in the product. So I mentioned business intelligence company. So what happened here, um, and it was several years ago, clients of ours, um, uh, they had a, an interaction, a dashboard that they created for a company called Business Objects. Business Objects is now part of SAP, I think. Um, so they created this dashboard. Uh, it needed, they needed an, a an API to Business Objects. And what they did was uh, they knew that Business Objects wouldn't give them a license uh, for, for the API. They set up a company elsewhere. They got a license, and they used that. So clever, sneaky in a way. Um, and the first thing that happened, 
they were proceeding quite nicely in business. First thing that happened was they received a cease and desist letter from some very big American lawyers. And once you get one of those letters, you don't forget the moment that you receive it. Um, very scary. They're going to sue the pants off you. They're going to close down your business. Um, so this company had not followed the right procedure. They were in big trouble. Except business objects looked at what they were doing and they realized that what they were doing was actually hugely clever and could add a huge amount of value to their business. So there was a balance going on. They were either going to buy the business for $6 million or they were going to sue the pants off them. We followed the transaction all the way through. And at the closing of the transaction, there were two rooms in the lawyer's office. One was the room in which we were doing the transaction where they were about to sign lots of contracts. And through a very thin wall, which we could hear through, there was another discussion going on saying, are we going to do this or are we going to sue the pants off them? So very, very scary moment. They got their $6 million, um, which was spread around a number of shareholders in the company. Uh, but it's, it was a very salutary lesson. So that's what happened with that one. So trademarks. Trademarks are another really powerful uh, intellectual property right. So the world is surrounded by trademarks. You saw the logos on the, um, on the slides before for all the trade associations. Uh, everybody's got logos. Um, the companies have names. They're distinctive. They might not be distinctive. Um, but a trademark, if you can register a trademark, then even if you're a small company in Leeds, if a company in Aberdeen or a company in Plymouth or something like that uh, tries to use the same mark, uh, even though they've never heard of you, you can stop them using that. So it's pretty powerful. Um, it's national, so you register in the UK, but then you can register in the UK and then around the whole of Europe uh, and then in any jurisdictions you want. So it's either an original word, uh, a graphical representation, so it might be a design, a logo, something of that sort. Um, it needs to be a mark of origin, so it can't be um, just descriptive. So if it just says... Yorkshire pizza or something like that. All it's saying is it's a pizza that's made in Yorkshire, but anybody can call something a pizza that's made in Yorkshire. Just using a ge geographical origin doesn't work. So really strong, really powerful, but it has to be distinctive uh, and it has to, be, uh, has to be original. It has to be specific to a type of industry as well. There are 45 different categories of industry that it has to slot within. So, okay, what happened with the Tour de France? Um, during the Tour de France, uh, there were, uh, when it was in Yorkshire, there were a huge number of events set up around that. What you had to do in order to use the Tour de France logo or the Tour de France name or anything much that identified you, you as being part of the Tour de France was pay a license fee to the, uh, the people who run the Tour de France. Uh, it's a very precious commodity, similar to the Olympics and World Championships and all those kind of things. Um, very precious commodity. So what happened? Uh, about a week before the tour hit Yorkshire, clients of ours received another cease and desist letter, another very scary letter. They were running a campsite on the route of the Tour de France, so I'm not giving up too much information because... Tour de France probably covered about 400 miles or something like that. So there were many, many campsites. So they received a letter saying, you've got to take down your, ne your name or you need to pay us, I think it was about £100,000. It was a lot of money that they were demanding. Um, so again, big problem for, for our clients. They faced being closed down completely or having to pay a large amount of money. Um, we were able to get out of that because at that stage, the Tour de France, what they didn't want was bad publicity a week before. They didn't want to be told that, or the world to hear that they're closing down campsites where hundreds of people are booked to, booked to go and to watch the, watch the race go by. So 
an amount was paid. It was a much smaller amount. Um, everybody who went, went away went away friendly, but uh, it was a real danger. So watch out about piggybacking on other people's uh, on other people's uh, trademarks. Very very powerful. Trademark costs two hundred pounds to apply for, one hundred and seventy pounds online. It lasts for ten years. Um, very inexpensive, unlike patents, uh, but really, really powerful. So, you need to ask, who owns the IP then? So, what happened with the care business? Um, the issue here is, if you're a limited company, you create something, you generally own the intellectual property. If you work for that company and you create something, the company owns the intellectual property. But if the company uses an external contractor, so who may appear to be in the same position as an employee, but actually they're self-employed, then the self-employed person, the contractor, owns the intellectual property unless there's an agreement in place saying the opposite. So people generally think, well, I've paid those people to create that thing, and therefore I own it. And that isn't how it works. It is in the States. There's a concept in the States of... Um, of um, uh, work for hire, but it doesn't work here. So, what happened with this domiciliary care company? Domiciliary care companies, they provide care for people living at home. They depend on armies of carers who go out, visit people, make their meals, wash them, do services for them. And in order to make that business work, you have to have a rotor. Uh, and so, there's rotor software specific for this. This company was selling, it was again six million, but six million pounds, company in Wales. Um, they'd had this software built for them. They thought they'd have it built for them, and then they'd sell it to other people, but they never got around to that. So again, we were in the final stages of the sale of the business. Um, and we'd been saying to this, to, to the people, the care company, you really, you haven't got ownership of this, and they're going to be asking about this. Um, so let's see whether we can get ownership. So we gently put a transfer of ownership document in front of the, uh, in front of the people who developed the software. Um, said, can you just sign this and send it back? Kind of thing. Um, and they ummed and they ahed and we didn't hear from them. And then again, arrived at a meeting venue, hotel, um, Celtic Manor in Wales. And as I walked through the door, um, a message came through on my phone saying, yes, we'll transfer it. We want a million pounds for this. So everybody was kind of, oh, shit, what's going to happen here? Um, so we, we then spent probably half a day thinking, how are we going to deal with this? Um, ultimately, I had to say to the to buyers, look, we've got this problem. Um, we've told you about it. And the we got round it because the people said, well, it would be nice to have, but we can get an off-the-shelf product. We can, we can deal with this our, ourselves. So the people who thought they were going to get a million pounds got absolutely nothing. Um, the sale went through. Our clients got six million pounds. Very, very nice for them. Um, so the key thing there is to be aware that contractors will generally own the intellectual property right unless you deal with it elsewhere. If there's no assignment, um, then you're in a really sticky position. Um, so, real unintended consequences of not getting this right. Um, mentioned the care, care company. Um, we got out of that one, but we had to be fairly nimble to, to do so. And um, what isn't intellectual property? So, intellectual property in formal terms, not domain names. So the fact that you've got a domain name doesn't mean you've nailed down ownership of that word um, because there will be many, many different varieties of domain names you can do. You need a trademark. Um, just having a company by a particular name doesn't mean you've nailed down that name either. Um, again, it's really a trademark that you need. And the fact that you're using your own name even that doesn't give you protection. So if your name is McDonald and you want to make burgers, you're going to get an even bigger cease and desist letter 
um, than, than the, these other people got. So you need to be really wary of that. So these are the kind of things where, particularly trademarks, as you go around and you see logos and you see slogans, um, what those are protecting is really valuable. And the fact that people go to enormous lengths, people like the big brand owners, Coke and McDonald's and the International Olympic Committee and so on, they go to enormous lengths to invest in those, uh, and this is why. So it's all around you. Um, in many cases, there are different layers of, of IP. I mentioned about gaming and about websites and so on. So knowing what those are, being able to recognize those, um, making sure that what you're using is something that you've got a right to use. Um, it's so easy now particularly to just copy, uh, copy content, copy words, cut and paste from one website to another website. We've had cases where um, people doing dog walking or people doing double glazing or all sorts of things, they just copy content from someone else's website. It's infringement of copyright. You can't do that. You'll get a cease and desist letter um, and it won't be nice. This is where a huge amount of value lies uh, in intellectual property. So you just need to know um, what it is and therefore how to protect it, um, how if you've taken steps to protect it, you then make sure that you, you, you're, you take the necessary steps. If, you do, if you've got intellectual property, you don't protect it, then you could lose those rights. So that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of intellectual property. Um, Happy to deal with questions later. I'll be around, around for a little bit. Um, but I hope that that's given you a flavor of where huge amounts of value lies. Um, and knowing that that value is there um, is the key to, to unlocking that value. Thanks very much.